Hi, so welcome. This is lesson 5.1 on uh, standard form categorical syllogisms. So what we're doing in this lesson, in this chapter, that's chapter 5, we'll be basically building on what we discussed and what we learned in our uh, last module, which was on categorical propositions. But in this case, instead of just talking about inference arguments, we're going to be talking about categorical syllogism. So let me start off with what a syllogism is. A syllogism is, a, is an argument that has two premises and one conclusion, each of which, um, each of which the pre all the premises and the conclusions are all in standard form, in terms of standard being standard form propositions, essentially the same stuff we learned last time. But there's a few things you need to learn about a categorical syllogism. First off, a categorical syllogism is Categorical syllogism is deductive. The second thing is that in order for a categorical syllogism to be in a standard form argument, there's a few things you have to know, right? Um, so we're going to have to talk about a few different terms here that we may that, that are going to be new to you. The first idea is what we call the major term of, of an argument. So let's just throw that up there on the board. The major term term of an argument is determined as the predicate of the conclusion, right? So the predicate of the conclusion, I just put C up there. There's also the minor term of an argument, right? And the minor term is the subject of the conclusion, right? So the minor term is the subject of the conclusion. And finally, there's a third term, which is called the middle term. And the middle term is essentially um, that term which only appears in the premises, right? So let's we'll put um, a term of the premises. Right. And once we understand what this, how these terms operate, we'll be in a very good position in order to evaluate whether or not certain sorts of categorical arguments or syllogisms actually are in fact valid. Um, so first off, you have to see that. So let's just throw an example up here on the board, maybe to make sense of this, right? This is a very simple example, right? And it's the idea, all men are uh, mortal, right? Um, all persons named Socrates are, are, are humans or are men. Therefore, all persons named Socrates are mortal, right? Or in other words, um, all, person, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. So this is in categorical form. So here's what we can take a look at. But first we look at the conclusion to determine what the major term is, right? The major term is the predicate, right? So in this case, it's the idea of mortality, right? Which occurs in the very first line of the argument. That's another thing that's necessary for all standard form categorical syllogisms, namely that the predicate term occurs in the first line and that the minor term occurs in the second line. Hence, major, minor, you can just think, if it's major, it's first, if it's minor, it's second. Right, so here is the minor term, and it's in the second proposition, second line of the of the argument. I'm sorry. Uh, now the middle term, conveniently in this case, right, it's an M, right, but it's the it's the term that only occurs in the premises, right. So this is a standard form categorical syllogism. Now there's four rules, and I guess I'll just quickly outline those rules for you. There's four rules that in order to make sure that an argument is in standard form. The first, and this is located on page 244 of your book, I'm actually looking at it right now, right? The first rule is that all these statements are standard form categorical propositions, so they have to be in standard form. The second is that the two occurrences of each term, term are identical, right? Namely, you can't compare non-like terms. The third rule is that each term is used in the same sense throughout the argument. And the fourth rule is that the major premise is listed first, and the minor premise is listed last, and then the conclusions last. Those are the rules. Right. So that's basically a standard form proposition. Now, there's two other things we're going to talk about, right? And that's the concept of the mood of an argument and the idea of a figure of an argument. All categorical propositions both have a figure and a mood. Now, the mood is essentially identified by three letters, right? Three letters of the proposition. Right? In this case, what we're looking at here, we have an A proposition, an A proposition, and an A proposition. So what we could say is that what we have here is a triple A. 
AAA, right? And that, sorry, my handwriting's bad, but we have an AAA, and this is the mood, right? Now, the other question, the term in which we use to identify these is what we call the figure. And the figure is very simple, and the figure refers to the location of the middle term. Now, there's actually four possibilities Right? Just to throw these up on the board, there's four possibilities for the figure. Four figures are possible. Right? So we have S, well, let's start here. We have M, P, S, M, therefore S, P. Right? And this is figure one. The other possibility is we have P, M, S, M, S, P, and this is figure two. Right? The other possibility is we have M, P, M, S, S, P, and this is figure three. And you can see how this next one's going to go probably, right? And that's going to be we have M, I'm sorry, we have P, M, M, S, S, P, and this is figure four. So essentially the way in which you can remember this, the four figures, is by their location, right? So figure one, two, three, and four. What I do in order to keep in, to remember myself is I just say one, two, three, four, right? Um, in order to keep, you know, I get that, that'll be backwards for you. So for you, it's one, two, three, four. And you can remember the figures in this sense. So you just basically have to memorize this. Now, if we went back to our original proposition, right? Uh, we had a triple A and our, mi our middle term was in this sense, so we had a triple A one, right? So that's the sort of proposition we were looking at, an AAA one, right? Um, and if you look in your book, there's actually a list of propositions in terms of the figure and the mood, which are unconditionally valid. Um, and this is located on page 247. Um, and this has to do with the figure. So let me write these up here for you. Right. Hopefully I'm not running out of time with the video. Right? So these are unconditionally valid in terms of the figure. Right? So let's just erase this. So these are unconditionally valid. And when I say they're unconditionally valid, what I mean is they're valid from both the Boolean and the Aristotelian perspective. Right? They're valid for both Aristotle and Bool, depending upon how, um, whether or not you commit the existential fallacy. Right? So we have the triple AAA1, the EA E1, the AII1, and the EIO1, right? All of which were unconditionally valid. Let me see if I can move that for you, right? And then up here, the figure two, right? We have the EAE2, the AEE2, the EIO2, and the AOO2. For figure three, we have IAI, AII. O, A, O, and the E, I, O. And for figure four, there's only three. That's the A, E, E, the I, A, I, and the E, I, O, four, right? So these are always valid, no matter what. And I'm sorry, it's hard to see that, but you can look on page 247, right? So these, so an A, 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 one, that's our first argument, is unconditionally valid, right? Such that if you determine what the argument form is, no matter what the terms are, you'll know whether or not it's valid. Now, the conditionally valid forms, there's, there's not as many of them, and you'll have to take a look at those on page 247, because I think I'm running out of time. <clears throat> so, uh, but obviously, there's more conditionally valid ones than there are unconditionally valid, and you probably get that just from learning the, uh, the difference between the existential fallacy and the Boolean and the Aristotelian discussion. Um, so, I hope this gives you a little bit of sense of what we're talking about when we talk about a categorical syllogism, but basically just an argument in which the major term comes first, the minor term comes next, and then of course you have the conclusion, which is subject predicate. And then we have the mood of an argument, which refers to the three type of propositions used in the argument. And we have the figure, which, to, which is, correlates to the location of the middle term in the argument. Okay, so this is 5.1. Read the lesson. Uh, read the book, which will give you more details, and then try the lesson review and do the homework. Okay?